Hey, this is the Big Hardcore Gamer, and in this video, I'm going to be reviewing Warhammer 40k Space Marine 2, which I played on PS5. As always, I'm going to try and keep this spoiler free, um, so I'll be keeping the majority of the footage to the first three chapters when covering the campaign, apart from a few occasions when I want to highlight something. As I mentioned in the title, I'm a Warhammer newcomer, and I hardly know anything about the lore of this series, which removes any biases that I may have had. I'll be covering all three aspects of the game, the campaign, operations, co-op modes, and the multiplayer. Um, so please watch until the end of the video, leave it a like, share it out, and click the subscribe button, and check out some other content. Right, let's get into it. Let's start off with the campaign, which I live streamed on Veteran Difficulty, and I'm currently doing an, my Angel of Death second playthrough. I absolutely loved this campaign. Um, Space Marine 2 is a third person shooter where you play as Titus, previously a captain, um, that was the protagonist in the first game, and a member of the Ultramarines, an elite genetically modified super soldier that you really just don't want to mess with. It's set roughly 200 years after the events of the first game. Um, this is entered in the dialogue from his comrades in the game, but also by the service studs in Titus's forehead. Uh, so yeah, um, those are studs. And I want to apologize to any Warhammer 40k fans who watched me stream the first game recently, as I kept asking, why do these dudes have bullets in their foreheads? <laughs> now that I've looked it up, um, each service stud represents 100 years of service to the Imperium. Um, he had two in the first game and he now has four. At the end of the first game, he was arrested on suspicion of heresy um, as he was able to hold a Chaos Stone and resist its power. Um, in Space Marine 2, he's given a second chance as an Ultramarine, but has been demoted down to um, Lieutenant and as to join the fight against the new enemy faction, the Terminids. Now, these creatures kind of resemble um, the Xenomorphs from the Alien franchise. Um, that's all I can really say about the plot without going to spoilers. Uh, one criticism I do have is that there wasn't a catch-up video at the start of the game, as I know there are a lot of gamers who never played the first game and won't know what previously happened. So I would recommend either watching a catch-up video on YouTube or playing the first game for yourself, which is available on Steam if you have a PC. When I first saw the trailer for Space Marine 2, it reminded me a lot of Gears of War, and that instantly piqued my interest. This isn't a cover-based shooter like Gears, but this is definitely Xbox 360 era greatness. The Ultramarines that you play as are huge. Um, when you stand next to a regular human in the game, they're twice the height and look like walking tanks. Um, there's a heavy focus on melee combat, just like in the first game, but with a slight difference. In the first game, the only way that you could heal was to do a glory kill. Um, in this game, glory kills will replenish your shield, but not always refill your health bar. Uh, this actually made things a lot more tense, as I'd often have an almost empty health bar, and only the shield was keeping me alive, as the enemies had to get through that first. Um, once the shield is gone, you'll start to take temporary damage on your health bar. This is shown by a white marking on the bar, which will gradually disappear, inflicting damage on, you, on the enemy will gradually replenish the white marking on the bar, uh, while executions will fill it completely. Stims are used for healing in this game instead, but you can only carry two at a time, and you don't start a mission with any equipped, so you'll have to search the area for them. When playing as Titus, you also have a special ability called Righteous Fury um, that will increase your damage and slowly fill your health bar as you inflict damage when activated. Uh, this came in very handy throughout the game. Um, whenever I was low on health and didn't have stims and needed to heal, um, you activate this by pressing the triangle button, but it's slow to recharge. Um, so you'll need to save it for when it's absolutely necessary, as it can definitely come in clutch. 
your AI squad members can revive you um, when you go down, but you only get a certain amount of revives um, before you permanently die and have to restart from the last um, checkpoint. And the amount of re revives depends on the difficulty that you're playing on. Uh, when playing on veteran, I could be revived twice and then die on the third. On Angel of Death, I can only get revived once and then die on the second. You will constantly get swarmed by Tyranids and pulling out your melee weapon is often the best option for dealing with these hordes um, whenever you find yourself getting overwhelmed. Um, there are melee combos where Odin R1 on the fourth swing will do a stomp or heavy swing um, which will usually take out a group or cause greater damage to tougher enemies. There's now a parry system which is a lot of fun. Uh, parrying smaller enemies will usually result in them exploding into chunks. Um, when there's an opportunity for a perfect parry you'll see a blue circle around the enemy and the good thing is this is also um, visible on enemies attacking you from behind. Uh, with small to medium enemies this will usually result in you grabbing them um, as they do a mid-air attack and brutally slamming them into the ground or stomping on them or even catching them with your, with your chainsword. For bigger elite enemies a couple of perfect parries will leave them stunned. Stunning them will place a target marker on their head allowing you to transition to a shot with your sidearm if you press um, the right trigger. With some, some enemies this will kill them, but with other tougher enemies and bosses it will just inflict damage and looks very cool when you do it. Um, when they've taken enough damage they'll stand there stunned and you're able to do an execution. Now these are brutal, gory and very satisfying. There are also some really good melee weapons. Uh, I mean, there's the chainsword, which everyone would have seen in the trailers by now. Um, the combat knife, which Rambo would be proud to see you use. And an energy sword and a thunder hammer, um, which is perfect for crowd control. Now, I've been talking about the melee combat a lot, but this is a third person shooter. So let's talk about the firearms. They're great and feel equally as devastating. Um, there are different versions of bolt rifles, sniper rifles and submachine guns. Um, the Melter Shotgun, which was one of my favourite um, guns from the first game, as it's perfect for turning groups of enemies into chunks um, when they want to get too close. Um, there's also the heavy weapons, the heavy bolt rifle and plasma incinerator, which are basically just the big brother versions of the bolt rifle and melter. And there are new grenades to choose from as well. I mean, my favorite is the crack grenades, which uh, they're basically sticky grenades and can be very useful when dealing with shielded enemies. The jump pack has received some improvements in this game. You can now hover for a short amount of time and pull out your primary weapon and start shooting. You can dash when in the air and you can also ground pound um, with different melee weapons. In the first game you could only do this with the thunder hammer. Um, you can also cover some serious distance with your ground pound. Now, I love how this is a simple linear action game and the campaign is at a decent length, around 10 to 15 hours depending on your difficulty. As someone who often deals with vast open world fatigue with a load of side quests, this is refreshing. You'll go from mission to mission, wiping out hordes of enemies, uh, which get tougher as you progress. Um, after each chapter, you'll return back to base where you can also equip new primary wef weapons and unlock armor. And when ready to deploy, um, you just move on to the next mission. It's well paced and there's not a single moment where I got bored. Some may find the combat repetitive, but I actually didn't have an issue with it because it's a type of gameplay that I was expecting. And there are a lot of epic moments, especially towards the end of the game. After the prologue, you go into every mission with two comrades. I played solo, so for me, um, they were AI partners, and they were usually decent like, you know, most of the time. Even when playing on the hardest difficulty, um, they're quite competent and will deal with enough enemies so that you don't feel too overwhelmed, but not too many so that you know the game is still a decent challenge. 
I noticed the, um, that they will leave some enemies in a stun state for you and allow you to go and execute yeah, them to replenish your armor. Uh, but I also saw them executing enemies when, when my armor was good. Uh, the game was clearly built for co-op and this is definitely evident in some missions where you play, where you have to protect multiple objectives. The AI will attack the terminals but they won't clear them off the objectives which resulted in a lot of failed attempts on some missions. You can invite players from your friends list but there's sadly no public matchmaking for the campaign mode. As you can see, this is a good looking game. I was originally worried about the performance mode because I saw a lot of people online saying it was bad, um, but I managed to play the entire campaign without any issues. I did do my first playthrough using the preview window in OBS because I was streaming and I didn't notice any serious performance issues, but I did notice some issues with frame rates a few times during my second playthrough and in the operations mode um, when playing on my TV, which is old and needs changing. Um, I do think it does need patching, but it wasn't bad enough to ruin my experience. My advice to you is to go to settings and turn off motion blur, as doing this, uh, you know, it eliminates a lot of problems. Now, the different environments that you'll fight through look great, whether it be a forest, a battlefield, or old cathedral, or one of the many other locations throughout the story. Um, it all looks great. Um, there's a lot of dead bodies in some of these levels as well, both terminates and human, and uh, it definitely lets you know that some shit went down in these areas <laughs> and the violence is graphic and gory and in some cases actually pretty colorful uh, when using the melter shotgun I was actually quite impressed with the effects of the gunfire and how colorful it was um, while also seeing their bodies explode um, when shooting terminates you see a lot of blood gushing from them and executions are really gruesome and there's a lot of blood and in some cases blood drenching so you really are ba behaving in the blood of your enemies in this one and as this is the PS5 version, let's talk about those DualSense features. Um, they're really good. <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, these Space Marines are some really big dudes. So I love that you can feel every footstep um, through the haptics on the controller as you're running. And you feel every gunshot through the adaptive triggers. It really helps to get you immersed in the battle. I have to mention these um, features whenever I notice them because I'm still playing some other games this year that for some reason I haven't taken advantage of the DualSense features. So it's good to see some third party games that are actually using them. It also comes with a photo mode at launch, which is great because a lot of games make us wait for it yeah. to be added these days. Yeah, I use it to take some decent photos and also yeah. used it to zoom in on Titus's armor. Um, I was able to read most of the That's chapter written on his armor. Really cool. So yeah. I was you know, very impressed with the, the attention to detail they put into this that. game. Right, so now let's talk about some of the negatives yeah, with the I campaign. Can't. I only found two bugs during my playthrough, which is really good. I mean, that isn't really a negative, but I'm going to talk about those two bugs here. The first bug happened during my first playthrough, and it was a pretty nasty one. I got to a tough section of the game where I couldn't pick up any stims or ammo, even though I could see them there to be picked up. Every time I restarted from the previous checkpoint, the problem just got worse, and um, there were more things that I couldn't pick up. Um, this was during one of the nightmare sections where you had to protect some objectives um, from hordes of enemies coming uh, coming towards you and I just couldn't heal. And even after restarting the game, that didn't fix it either. Um, even though I saw online that this was a fix for the problem. It took a lot of executing terminates to replenish my shield and using the Righteous Fury ability to get through this section. Uh, the second bug was minor and uh, you know it was found during my second playthrough <clears throat> where the audio for my squad wasn't working but I knew that they were speaking you know because of the subtitles. Like I said it was minor but my biggest negative is that the single player campaign seems to be always online. Um, I didn't understand why 
uh, this was the case. I mean, I know it needs to be online for co-op, but it's annoying having to go through long loading times after every mission while watching a joining server progress by at the bottom of the screen. If you're new to Warhammer 40k, you may also get confused with who or what some characters are. Um, I ended up saying, you know, who that is this <laughs> a couple of times during my live stream. But it's a case of doing your own research into the lore because Warhammer has been around for a very long time. So I wouldn't really class it as a negative. I do think that they should have put a recap video at the beginning of the game though, especially with um, this game's ending. So now let's talk about the operations co-op modes. I haven't beaten all of these yet, but I'm definitely enjoying them. Now, these operations take place parallel to the main campaign and take roughly 30 minutes to complete each one. But again, it depends on which difficulty you're playing on and how good your team is. You have to choose one of six classes, each with their own special ability and weapon sets. Um, for example, the Assault class gets the Jump Pack as a special ability, a melee weapon and sidearm, while Vanguard gets a Grapnel Launcher that lets you grapple an enemy and launch yourself towards them. Each team member has to use a different class, so it does encourage you to try out new classes. The missions are structured pretty much like the campaign. You have objectives to complete and you're given a lot of enemies to kill. You fight through them and you're given a boss fight at the end of the mission before extracting back to base. The XP you get will raise your Vanguard level, which will allow you to unlock different weapons and armor sets. You will also be rewarded credits and discoverable armory data, um, which will allow you to buy new weapon skins and unlock perks for your weapons, as well as unlock perks for your class to help you in battle. And there are a lot of perks for each class and weapons. Plus there's a challenge um, anytime you increase the difficulty. So there's definitely a lot of replayability in this mode. And more operations will be added to the game later, so I may be playing this one for a while. Now it's time to talk about the multiplayer. First of all, I want to say how happy I was that the multiplayer was included as part of the package. It's a reminder of how things used to be back in the day when you could buy a single player game and it would have the multiplayer mode included at no extra cost with no battle pass. You know, the good old days. But the issue with the multiplayer is that it's really bare bones. It's a 6v6 multiplayer, uh, which is basically Space Marines versus Heretics. At the launch, um, there's only three maps, which that's crazy for any multiplayer um, game to launch with only three maps these days. And it's only three modes. You've got Seize Ground, which is this game's version of Domination, Capture and Control, which is Hardpoint or King of the Hill, and Annihilation, which is basically Team Deathmatch. At the beginning of the match, you choose one out of the six classes, and there could be a maximum of two players as one class, which in a way is, is, is good for balancing. Um, the time to kill can be long at first because you have to get through their shields before you restart causing any damage, but when you start unlocking better weapons, it's, it actually gets better. I do think the weapons upgrades are weird for some classes though. Um, the classes that can only carry sidearms are limited to which ones they can carry, uh, but I think you should be able to have access to all of the sidearms. If you're not in a good team, you can struggle to turn the tide of battle, which is why I wasn't enjoying the multiplayer that much at first. The invisibility cloak for the sniper class is also extremely annoying. I mean, where well, it is when you're on the receiving end of it. But once I realized you can equip the SMG uh, when using the sniper class, I tried it and actually I started having a lot of fun with it. Um, I was also having a lot of fun with the assault class as you can um, get the jump pack and can uh, ground pound the opposition. Basically, this mode is growing on me, um, but we need more content for it. The biggest disappointment for me um, with this mode is that there's no gore. Now, I have to make the comparison with Gears of War again. The multiplayer in that series was just as gory as the campaign, and I was hoping to get the same thing here. 
I wanted to see blood spraying from my opponents. I wanted to see them explode into chunks when I get them with a grenade. And most of all, I wanted to see executions, especially when one of the weapons is a chainsaw. I would have liked to have seen, you know, some maps with power weapons that you can fight over as well. But all the power weapons are locked behind the every class upgrade path. Um, just like in operations mode, the weapons are unlocked by increasing your vanguard level. I mentioned earlier that you can unlock new armor sets, but you can also unlock color schemes and create custom color schemes for your classes. I started playing around with, with this and got pretty addicted <laughs> very quickly. And this gave me an incentive to continue playing the operations and multiplayer modes. I remember walking past the tabletop shops in town and seeing people, you know, painting their um, Warhammer figures. Uh, so allowing us to be able to do this in the game is actually pretty genius. Now it's time for the verdict. Space Marine 2 is a reminder of the games that we used to get back in the 360 era that I love and miss, but with updated graphics and features. It's bloody, gory, and a lot of fun to play. It's a good length, so I had no problems you know, loading it up for a second playthrough. The operations mode is fun, and the grind for armor customization makes me want to replay them you know, for, for the different camo options and unlocks. I love that it comes with the multiplayer, but this was actually the only part of the game that I was disappointed with. It is growing on me and I'm going to keep playing it, but the multiplayer should have released with more maps and modes. But it's a start, which can be improved with, you know, with future updates. Taking all of this into consideration, Space Marine 2 is amazing. Right, so I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, if you made it this far, please hit the like button. Um, these reviews take a long time to make, so please also share the video out. Um, if you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe button and check out some of my other content. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.